Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the ACE Mentor Program of Washington Student Presentation Night. My name is Angela Gatula. I'm the Executive Director of the ACE Program here in uh, the Puget Sound area. Um, for 19 years in our area, the ACE Mentor Program has brought together key sectors of the design and construction industry, architecture, engineering, construction management, real estate development, and more. We raise awareness, we've raised the awareness to hundreds of high school students to the possibility of careers in these fields. In 2001, and um, since 2001, an estimated 3,000 students have gone through our local ACE program. We've awarded more than seven, $764,000 in scholarships, and we plan to award $100,000 or more to 14 seniors in a couple of weeks. About 200 and 20 students from 64 high schools in our area have participated in this year's program, which consists of 11 teams, seven in Seattle, two on the east side, and two in the South Sound area. Our Puget Sound program ranks among one of the highest in the nation for the number of high schools that are involved. 64 is a big number. These students are being mentored by 210 of the brightest professionals from 65 of our region's architectural, construction, and engineering firms. At about four o'clock or so this afternoon, I emailed everyone on this call who had registered a 13-page program. It went to students, parents, mentors, and registrants of this event. In the program, it lists all the names of the students and the mentors uh, for this event tonight and explains a bit more about our student project. Um, I'd like to give a special congratulations to this year's outstanding seniors. Um, and I'd also like to recognize two students who are on the call tonight, Julia Spikert, who's on the uh, Tuesday one team, and Marcel Ramirez, who I think is on the Tuesday three team. Those two young men have been in ACE for all four years of their high school career. They are four year ACE students. That is quite an accomplishment. Congratulations to everyone. Yay, clap. <laughs> Um, the program that I sent you also has links to our Facebook and our Instagram pages. Be sure to like them, like us, and check us out um, if you'd like. Um, so now on to the Project RFP. Over the course of this school year, the teams visited construction sites, learned about each of the disciplines, and they met bi-monthly at mentor firm offices um, around town. The team spent most of the year working on a design project in response to a mock request for proposal that the ACE leadership team created. So all of the students' hard work culminates in this evening's presentations. This year, several design challenges will be showcased. So you guys are a little uh, interesting because tonight we're going to talk about two RFPs. Uh, one RFP was sent out nationally. So there was a national design competition. They sent it to all 77 affiliates around the country. And we had the option to respond to it if we wanted to compete in a national competition. Uh, the Tuesday team one chose to do that. That they, um, they did a design uh, coming up with a solution for a water resource management challenge in our area. And they're going to talk about that tonight when they give their presentation. The other two teams, the Tuesday three team and the Thursday team, responded to an RFP that we created locally, which um, was a waterfront development project with a site along the, um, the waterfront in downtown Seattle. So we will learn more about that later. Um, I look forward to, to seeing these presentations tonight and seeing how the teams responded. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, before I went on that uh, our Tuesday team one who submitted to the national competition did receive uh, um, recognition for their award. They were not in the finalists, which present at, an, at the uh, big event in Washington, D.C., well, virtually, but they did receive second runner-up in their category. With that comes scholarship dollars that are given to our affiliate that we can pass on to students. So congratulations to those students. They're outlined in the program that I sent earlier today, so you can see who participated on that team. Um, of course, we also want to acknowledge the incredible effort of all of the mentors and students as we worked around school closures and the quarantine mandates, and we transitioned to a virtual ACE program. All 11 of this year's teams finished their designs and recorded their presentations to be webcast in a series of virtual events this week. Tonight is the second of five ACE events, and we'll be celebrating this, this accomplishment all week. Congratulations again to everyone involved, the students, the mentors, and especially the families for finishing out this year so strong. So 
For our virtual event tonight, to make it a little special, we invited a panel of judges to review the presentations and moderate our Q&A session. So I'd like to introduce our panel to you. We chose three distinct professionals that each serve a different purpose in relation to ACE. First, Sarah Holstead uh, is the, an Associate Vice President at Callison RTKL, an architecture firm in Seattle. Sarah currently serves as Vice President on the ACE Board of Directors. She's been involved with ACE for years, and we're really grateful she could be with us tonight. Second, we invited a former ACE mentor leader, Sage Shingle is a senior project manager at Taylor and Saifan, I think I'm saying that right, um, consulting, and Sage lives in Santa Barbara, California. So he is uh, calling in from California today. Sage has been with ACE for a really long time, and when he lived in Seattle, he was a team leader here. Um, it's really exciting to have him with us. And something else you might not realize is that when Sage moved to Santa Barbara, California, there was no ACE program. So what did he do? He started it there. He's the one who put in all of the effort and made the calls and found the colleagues and the students and the mentors and put together an ACE program in Santa Barbara. So if anybody knows about ACE at stage, and I'm glad he could be one of our judges tonight. Lastly, we also invited Philip Greeny. He's the Director of Business Development at Mortensen uh, in Bellevue. Uh, we invited him as an ACE industry representative. Uh, Mortensen is a, as a firm is a, a wonderful supporter of the ACE program all over the country. And we're glad Phil could join us tonight. So, thank you to these three panelists for participating. Um, okay, so before we get started, I just want to run through a couple of logistics about how tonight is going to go. So, number one, all attendees should stay muted. I think if you are an attendee on the call, I don't even know if you can unmute yourself. So, let's do that. Uh, the student should notice that their names are already set as first name, last name, and then their team name. So, there are two designations on this call, the attendee and the presenter. And you'll notice that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So if you are an attendee on the call, you should be able to open up that Q&A button, click that Q&A button, and you can write in questions. If you are a presenter on this call, you should be able to respond to those questions. It doesn't work the other way around. Attendees can't respond to questions and presenters can't write questions. So what we're doing as the event goes on is when it is your team's turn to have your video presentation shown, you will be a presenter on the call. And then when your team's video is done and it's time for the next team to go, we will turn you into an attendee and then promote those uh, students to presenter modes so they can respond to questions. So it's a little bit of shuffling. Just imagine that we're all in a big theater and right now everybody's at the front of the stage. And then as students sit down and stand up and get acquaint, get ready for to approach the microphone, that's what will happen. There's a little bit of transi transition time as we shuffle. At the end of each video presentation, the guest judges will moderate the Q&A session. So I'd like the judges to keep an eye on that Q&A box. If you see a question that you think is interesting that maybe somebody typed an answer to and you'd like to bring it up again for the whole group to answer, I'd like you to do that. Uh, the guest judges can also think of questions that come to their minds that they would like to um, ask about as they're watching the presentations. Um, and then the students or the team that's being presented will have the opportunity to answer those questions. Um, uh, another thing I wanted to ask is just to please remain for all three presentations, especially if you're just here to see the first one. Um, it shows a lot of respect and support for all of the students who have put in a ton of effort uh, for, for ACE this year. So also, I, we put these three, the three of you together because you're the shortest of the presentations. So hopefully this evening will flow together nicely. Okay, I would like to get started. I'm, our first team tonight is going to be Tuesday Seattle Team One. Um, the team leaders are Kyle Kaiser with LMN Architects and John Robinson with Skanska. Mm, do you, do you, Mark, should we have them speak first or do you wanna, should we move everybody into attendee mode first? Well, that keeps being weird. Um, let's go ahead and move everyone. Okay, uh, and then we'll then we'll keep going. Okay, so for right now, the Tuesday three students and the Thursday students are going to see yourselves being moved to um, to attendee mode. Got it? All right. Give us just a second while we do this. Hey, Mark, you need to make me a host. I'm not a host right now. 
I'll make Mark do it. Oh, no, he did it. It's magical. We need some fancy music playing or something. Okay, I think we got everybody. Abigail, Abigail changed your name so I know what team you're on. We're ready. Mark? Um, yep, we're good to go. Okay, so Kyle and Kyle and John, would one of you want to take the stage for a little bit? Just introduce your team and then we'll start your video. Sure, we do a little present, uh, a little introduction in the video, but uh, I just want to say uh, that uh, it, this was a real experiment for us this year. Uh, we participated in the CERT design competition as a number of years, but typically we do it as an extra activity on top of ACE and our students this year really took on the challenge and submitted three great entries. Um, we're really proud of them and really proud of the work that they produced. Um, so I really want to thank the students for uh, working hard and going with the flow this year for all of our weird ACE firsts um, and we look forward to having you again next year unless you're graduating and we look forward to having you as a mentor in the future. Um, I also want to thank our mentors. Uh, Again, this was an experiment for them. And so I just really appreciate them also being flexible and, and working with us uh, to make the best out of the year. And uh, lastly, I just wanna thank uh, the parents uh, for supporting our students and uh, sending us kind words as we switched into the COVID quarantine. It was nice to hear that uh, some of the things that uh, were sent our way. So we appreciate that. And uh, I hope that you're very proud of your students tonight because they did a great job. This is the year-end final presentation from Seattle ACE Tuesday Team 1, consisting of mentors from LMN, Skanska, Notkin, Coughlin, Porter Lindeen, and Suyama Peterson Deguchi. A uh, big shout out to the mentors this year, as well as an even bigger shout out to the students who put together this great presentation with a lot of awesome content. Uh, overall presentation is titled The Locks Down as a uh, play on our current uh, quarantine situation, as well as the uh, focus on our uh, problem statement for the year and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kyle Kaiser our mentor or team leader to tell you a little bit more about the project and uh, we'll see what the students have to say. So this year we uh, took part in the CERT design competition. Uh, this is something that we've been doing uh, as an extra ACE activity uh, for a number of years. Uh, this is the first year that we've decided to for the whole team to go after it. Um, the CERT competition is a uh, partnership with ACE Mentor Program and the Chicago Architecture Center and invites students from ACE teams around the country to uh, submit entries into a design competition uh, for three different challenges. Uh, this year, uh, the three challenges were water resource management, a national pavilion, or a gastronomic center. There were 52 entries and we were three of those and we all submitted under the water resource management and preservation challenge. Uh, one thing to note is that one of our teams that you'll hear later on tonight, the technology team was chosen as the second runner up in that category. So congratulations to them. And I just wanna thank every, uh, all the mentors and the students for some amazing hard work this year. Uh, Moving into the water preservation challenge, uh, we felt that we had one of the greatest resources uh, in water resource management here in Seattle uh, is the Ballard Lock. So we chose that as our site um, and the students ahead will tell you how we tackled that as a design problem. Uh, so we're gonna begin uh, with our phase one, which we're calling our introduction and research and uh, Nathan and Julius will be giving you some more information about how we got started this year. 
Okay, so the amazing ACE race was essentially our introduction to the ACE program and everybody was dis divided into different groups and we all went to diff from station to station in different orders and each station provided some sort of problem that required a solution. And this was essentially our introduction into engineering. So my personal favorite was the popsicle stick bridge challenge because it required us to build a popsicle stick bridge that had enough structure to support the full weight of a book. And now Julius will speak about our site analysis. Hi, um, I'm Julius, and uh, for our site analysis, we visited the Ballard Locks. Um, this was so that we could get a better grasp of the site that we are going to be working on. Um, this entailed us walking around the site and observing different things. So we started by observing materials, compositions, what was used to make the locks, the lighting patterns, because we went at night, so it helped us to look at what the night light was like. We looked at pathing pedestrians and bicyclists. We did scaling observations, so the size of the locks, comparison of different components and the actual platform. And then we also looked at the daily operations and functions of the locks to keep in mind. This led us to do our site analysis for the locks based on these observations. Uh, with the site analysis, we started with doing um, lighting observations and sound observations. Because we went at night, the lighting observations helped a lot. Um, we looked at the disparity between the Magnolia and Ballard side with lighting and lack of lighting if there was any. We also did scaling observations. So looking at the actual size of the locks and trying to get an actual um, size comparison of the site to other areas. We also looked at historical aspects and themes. So based the buildings and the themes that were present at the locks that we thought were interesting and that we might want to keep. We also went in and looked at the material composition. So what made up the locks. So that was mainly the steel and concrete. We uh, also looked at the color palette, which was mainly gray and green. Uh, we also looked at elevation maps so and of the locks area. So that was the Magnolia and contrasted with the Ballard side of the locks and the water zones, so the different uh, height comparisons. We also looked at circulation and zoning. So this would be the park areas, the locks itself, the pedestrian pathways, and how the locks is integrated into the surrounding area. Finally, we looked at the animals and foliage. Um, so this would do with all the wildlife that existed in the area. So the herons, the seals, the fish. We also looked at the canopies um, and all the elements that we would have to be building around. Uh, all this analysis helped us to look at uh, problems or things we found dissatisfactory or needed improvement, which led us to do personal research projects, which Nathan will talk about now. Okay, so after the site analysis, what we decided to do next was our president research study, which is basically just looking at past architecture projects and seeing if we could find any ideas from those projects to implement into the Ballard Locks. So we came up with a list of like basic themes to look at when we're looking for past projects. And once we were done, we also came up with our site analysis conclusion of basically what we wanted to implement into the Ballard locks in the future. And here is here are some of our final submissions that people submitted at the end of the project. After the president research study, we decided to split up into three groups to focus on different aspects of the Ballard locks. So we split up into ecological, architectural, and technological but we also wanted to make sure that all of these three groups centered around the main theme of the ballad box and focused on what we wanted to improve. And now the project teams are going to share their CERT competition entries, beginning with the technology team. Hi, I'm Ariane Enero from CERT technology team, and here's our project description. The locks are the significant transit point for people and boats. We have locks to provide easier transportation for boats. Then boats can easily cross the waterway and can head their ways to the Puget Sound and Lake Union. Not having the locks can make way harder problems for boats to transit. This area is also an important transit crossing for people and bikers to making their way between Ballard and downtown. Waterways are important in Seattle because transportation of people and goods throughout the area 
as well as for recreational and biodiversity reasons. We decided to make a series of smaller interventions and upgrades around the site to improve the experience for visitors, tourists, and commuters without disrupting the historical fabric of the locks or their daily functioning. Our technology team includes lighting updates for safety, which is for the darker areas in the lock. Example, there's a visitor center and the old building, etc. We also included lighting improvements, which has more eco-friendly light and decreasing light pollutions and etc. Our structure analysis includes two-lane expansion, walkway, and gate expansions. Our energy generation includes amount of power that power locks will use found by estimating equipment and hours used. It also includes net zero generation. Construction phasing turbines includes where and timetable wise. I am Max, I'm from the technology team. So one of the first things we noticed in our initial site visits was how narrow the walks on top of the gates were. The existing pathways only covered the width of the gate, which was under three feet. To alleviate this, we designed a system of hydraulic pistons and scissor lift style mechanisms, which would allow the walkway to expand to three times the size. On the bottom left, you can see a partial section of the larger spillway. In phase one, you can see all three walks are stacked on top of each other. We designed the extension like this so that the gate could fit into the existing pocket with the extensions on top. The guardrails are fastened to the sides of the outermost walks, which creates a barrier so that pedestrians cannot get onto the gate while it's open. As you can see in the diagrams of phase two and three at the bottom, the bottom two walks extend out laterally to their respective positions. Then in phase four and five, the scissor lift mechanisms lift the walkways vertically to the height of all the existing pathways. This extension of the pathway ultimately creates a three lane walkway where you can have lanes for walking, biking, and sitting or observation. This also allows the pathway to be wheelchair accessible. This is a much needed update for the locks, which have the potential to be a hub for commuting because of their close proximity to aerial streets. In addition to the gate walkway expansion, we also designed an expansion of the spillway with three lanes. This part of the locks does not move, so we were able to put a canopy over this part of the expansion with benches under. We designed this expansion to complement the existing design of the spillway by using similar materials and curved steel structural members. Because the locks and the expansion mechanisms require energy to operate, as well as the accessory buildings like public restrooms, it was important to find a sustainable way to power the buildings. We chose to install solar panels in the median between the two spillways because the median area is an area where many people come to watch the gates open and close, and it was imperative that we elevated the solar panels to create a canopy, which would also protect people from the rain. So my name is uh, Patrick, and uh, here's uh, my presentation on lights. Um, so something we noticed about the lack of bright lights is that, um, uh, we brought a photometer that would uh, help us measure the lighting in the surrounding area. Uh, the photometer showed that there were a couple of spots where there was no lighting at all. This lack of lighting led us to the idea that we would put lights in spots where there are none and use brighter lights. Of course, um, if we installed those lights, we would have uh, chosen brighter blue lights. We also looked at some of the places where we needed uh, lights to showcase highlights of the locks, like the locks themselves and the buildings that are placed around it. I'm Will from the CERT technology team. And in the technological group, there were lots of small projects proposed to be completed. These tasks were scattered all around the site, allowing for multiple of them to be worked on at one time. The tasks were separated into phases that could overlap with one another, increasing efficiency. And to limit the impact of the major constructions that required closure, they were scheduled during the winter, which were the lowest activity for tourists and commuter. Another thing that was done to help our site reach net zero power generation was the implementation of turbines. They were planned to be installed on the east side of the spillway to utilize the flowing water for power generation. The energy generated would be put directly back into powering and utilizing the power for the utilities on the site. A rough estimate of the total cost for the entire project was created by finding the cost of certain aspects of the projects and totaling them up.
these additions that we decided to make on the locks had a large impact on it. There was an improvement in the flow of pedestrians, decreased light pollution, and an increase in the power efficiency of the entire site, all the while disrupting the residents nearby as little as possible. Hi, I'm Gina from the architecture team. The, the architecture team approached the Bower Lock site with the intent of highlighting the existing site conditions and enhancing the experiences that are made possible by the Treasure Seattle Landmark. During our site visit to the Bower Locks, we noticed a lot of differences between the Ballard and the Magnolia sites. We also noticed that the main purpose of the site was for people to commute between the two sites and due to people traveling back and forth so often, we noticed that most of the park space was unused. So the Ballard side, we came up with the dome located in an open portion of the Botanical Gardens to eliminate the need to cut down the surrounding trees. The purpose of the dome is to build a space for the community to gather in an area that wasn't often put to use, which also helps siphon people away from the main circuit vision path. Split into multiple uses, the dome holds an amphitheater, a cafe, and expanding markets blooming up from the structure like a flower. Taking advantage of its location in an open field near the water, the dome's programming also has an observation deck to see boats passing through the locks and birds flying above. To add on, the dome structure itself was an open air to be more environmental friendly, letting both indoor and outdoor programs to take place around the structure and expanding outwards. The idea of the dome was based on a seed rising from the earth growing as time passes in size and function for the community around Ballard and Magnolia. So the dome would grow using spiraling ramps over time in many different programs that are present and correlating with the Magnolia site. Right. Hi, I'm Gabe from the architecture team. And unlike the lush and landscaped foliage present on the ballad side of the locks, upon crossing to the Magnolia neighborhood, the natural scenery reflects the more functional nature of the waterway. We wanted to play off this contrast with an industrial yet modern take of the steep slopes of the Magnolia Commodore Street Passage. The goal was to revitalize the rather forgotten space by highlighting its natural features. With these ideas in mind, we sought to create a structure that reflected the terrace landscape of the existing Commodore Park blending the building's extensive balconies with the natural grade. The site would host a museum, visitor center, sea life observation deck, and general community space while spiraling like a fan from the perspective of a fish to that of a bird. Given the rather large scale of such a project, the building would be constructed in phases as money becomes available. The terrace spiral design of the building would offer a unique ability to, to simply add additional floors when necessary and able. Hi, I'm Matthew with the architecture our plan with the site was to help circulation from both sides. So with the dome on one side and the wedge on the other, we controlled the flow of moving people. We decided to phase the project. The perks of phasing is that it helps determine the important parts of the project first. It also allows to determine the best seasons for construction to take place, avoiding the busy days or the salmon migration. During our project, we were forced to use coffer dams to allow for more maneuvering space and allow us to reach areas normally inside the water. As for time frame, we scheduled out a five-year plan. To find the total cost, we used Excel, took estimates of type of that part of the building, and used square footage to find the total cost of that area included. The total cost was roughly $11 million, with the cost per square foot at $640. The dome is about 30% of the total estimate, the wedge is about 50%, and the overhead and taxes are about 30% of all costs. This includes design and construction contingency, with additional costs for possible bridge expansion later. With a project like this, we needed to possibly add expansion, where hopefully we could then later expand and add maybe a bridge to, to span the, bat, the gap between sides to help with circulation more than we already are. Allowing for the future is important because it means that we are caring for those of the future generations of people who will also use this site. This concludes the architectural team's project. Next up is a quick presentation from the ecological team. Hi, I'm Kyla from the uh, ecological team. 
Um, so our task was to make the locks more sustainable for the plants and animals that live there in a project that we called the Damn Good Solution. Um, the worst ecological impact of the site right now is felt by the salmon whose natural environment has been disrupted by the locks and spillway. This impact on the salmon is felt by all the other animals in the ecosystem as well. In our design, we wanted to address this issue as the main ecological change. To accomplish all the changes we wanted to make, um, we broke into three smaller sub-teams, a team to tackle the salmon ladder, one to make the circulation better, and one to add more bridges between the ballard and magnolia sides. Hi, I'm Clyde. I did circulation. Um, we made multiple fun paths and bridges down the hill and across the ballard locks. The orange arrow is the commuter bridge, the red arrow is the viewing bridge, the blue arrow is the commuter path, and the green arrow is the wheelchair accessible path. One of the paths we designed are slower and wheelchair accessible, made for more tourists and families. The path has circular rest areas slash viewing locations for people if they need to take a break from walking or to admire the surrounding view. There are stairs in between each rest area to cut through the switchbacks. The other path is more for daily commuters. We want the commuters to have a fast and spacious way down the hill without the tourists in the way. Both of our paths will flow into a small plaza area that is located at the base of the hill, which the uh, bridges are also connected to. Hi, I'm Benjamin. I worked on the bridges. And so right, we, uh, the problem is that the current bridges are too narrow and they often get overcrowded. So we decided to build three more bridges, um, or two more bridges and add to the first bridge. Uh, so we have the bridge on the locks, that's um, the original bridge. And we have the commuter bridge, which is on the east side over on Lake Union in the red dot. And then we have the tourist bridge which goes through the estuary here it's the curved meandering one uh we we built this one be, that way we can have uh quicker transportation for uh all commuters and that way the commuters can get out of the way of the tourists it's on the east side of the locks and it comes in two sections so this is the there's the first section uh that extends from the ballad side to the dam that is a drawbridge and that lifts up and then the other side is from the end of the dam to the magnolia side and that's just a regular bridge but it's disguised as a fish as well this is the bridge on the locks and the problem with this bridge is that it's too narrow right so it'd be more like the bottom picture uh, with the improvement that we're making it'll be much wider and much easier to get across like the top picture it's going to go where the current lock door is located. We're going to have walls that give it more height. But as the lock doors close, then those walls will fold down and offer a wider bridge to walk across. Um, and then the tourist bridge is going to look like the lower bridge here, the, the bottom bridge, but it's going to curve and it's going to go through our estuary. Hi, I'm Ian from the ecological team and I worked on redesigning the fish ladder. So we knew that there were some major problems we wanted to focus on with it and those were the rough edges, the tight turns, and the really quick temperature change that the salmon couldn't really deal with. So with our redesign, we knew we'd have to uh, solve these problems. Um, so to uh, solve some of them, we, uh, well, to solve them all, we wanted to mimic a natural estuary system. So uh, next slide. So the area around the uh, spillway was to be filled in with uh, some glacier till and culverts were placed underneath to replace the spillway function. We were gonna bring Washington native plants and animals to the estuary and to increase the biodiversity. And the, uh, we were hoping that the winding river uh, estuary system will help bring a gradual temperature change. Um, the native plants and animals brought in will just help strengthen the uh, ecosystem as increased biodiversity just makes it stronger. Uh, next slide. For the biodiversity of the locks, um, we knew that salmon are a keystone species, which means that 
they are required to keep the uh, ecosystem steady and balanced. So um, we knew that before the locks, the salmon uh, population was not affected and was stable and the ecosystem reflected that. But after the locks were built, um, their population shot way down and plants and animals stopped coming to this area. So our goal for this was to increase the uh, amount of salmon actually able to go through this by redesigning the fish ladder into a natural estuary system. Uh, the project would cost almost $65 million and would be broken into six different phases of construction. Um, and along with the major changes of the estuary, the pathway and the bridges, the current administration building in the middle of the site would be transformed into a gift shop and visitor center. The current center is too far out of the way and by relocating it to the center of the site, it will get more attention and profits from the gift shop could go to the upkeep of the locks. And that brings us to phase three. Uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic started, we went virtual uh, for the first time in ACE history. Uh, we decided to focus uh, on specific disciplines of structural and civil engineering, mechanical engineering, architecture and construction management so that the students could get a little bit more direct exposure to that after spending most of the year working on uh, a myriad of activities for the design competition. All right, take it away students. Hi, I'm Alden, and I looked at how structural engineers take gravity into account when they design buildings. So basically, there are three different load types that engineers need to consider. The first one is dead loads, which includes materials like steel, concrete, and wood. These are things that are always part of the building. The second load type is live loads, which is things like people and desks. These are things that aren't always going to be present. The third load type is snow, which is just snow. Structural engineers' jobs are to make sure the building can transfer these loads from the surfaces that are on to the ground. One way they do that is by using modeling software called RESA, which can model a canopy to see how well it handles a load. My name is Eric, and in addition to the gravity forces, structural engineers need to account for lateral forces, such as wind and seismic activity. Shear walls are used so that the forces are diverted to the base of the structure, which is stronger than the rest of the structure. The expected force that the base will need to be able to withstand is known as the base shear and calculates all of the forces that will act upon the building. This can be mapped using a, the design software eTabs and can help a structure uh, prevent being destroyed. Hi, my name is Keila, and during our virtual meetings, we, the civil engineering team, uh, learn about stormwater treatment and how to apply it to our site. At our first meeting, we learned about um, the modular system and the bioretention pond. We learned that the modular system is more expensive but takes up less space, while the bioretention pond is cheaper but takes up more space. After learning this, we applied our learning to our site. In the picture above, we came up with three different systems on the Magnolia side. We first looked at which system would work best on each side. On the Magnolia side, we agreed that the modular system would work best since we don't have much space to work with. We also figured out that it would actually take more time and money to install the biotension pond compared to the modular system. As for the Ballard side, we have plenty of space to work with, so either system would work. Hi, I'm Perrin from the mechanical engineering team, and during the quarantine and online meetings, we worked on both calculating envelope loads for heating and the, a lot of mechanical systems in large buildings, such as the HVAC systems. Um, to our left is the calculation for envelope loads of a cooling system of a 15 by 20 by 9 foot room containing four people. The total energy required is calculated by the change in temperature, the area needed, and the density of the material. To the right is a typical HVAC system. Um, we have tubing coils which change the temperature of the air as it passes through, which is then dispersed into the room, and then it goes back through an rerun air duct to be processed. You see a compressor in about the middle of the page which transfers heat to and from the room in the form of refrigerant running through the tubing. 
Now, that this is not shown in the diagram, but there would also usually be a method to conduct fresh air into the system as stale air is cycled out. Hi, my name's Alora, and I'll be presenting the vir act architecture virtual session activity slide. In this activity, there are two groups. We were given a list of programs, as you can see on the left sides of each picture. Group one focused on creating a coffee shop as their main part and the gallery as their side, while group two focused on creating a gallery as their main part and the coffee shop as their side. Both group one and group two's intention when placing the programs in relation to each other was to place them in a place where it'd be convenient to the people using them. And since it is mainly about direct and indirect relations, both groups place programs next to each other if it was thought to be necessary and the most fitting. For example, both groups place the prep, the counter, and the storage next to each other for the coffee shop part. As you can see, group one decided to place the gallery program on, the bo on both sides of the wall and the stage on the remaining side of the wall so that from the sitting areas in between the galleries and the stage have a clear view of both the galleries and the stage. While group one placed the seating tables as part of the lounge, group two decided to place the seating tables closer towards the coffee shop than the gallery and place the lounge between the gallery and coffee shop in order for it to have access to both the coffee shop and gallery. For the second part of the activity, we were to place the programs in relation to an actual site in Seattle. The site is located on Greenwood Avenue, and there's an intersection at Greenwood Avenue North and North 43rd Street nearby. Some other information about this site is that it is on a 30 feet grade change, and there's also a pedestrian stair to the north of the site. Both groups chose to have two entrances, a main entrance coming from the main road and the secondary entrance coming from the pedestrian stair. Both pathways that lead to the entrances potentially have a lot of circulation of people, making it the best place to put the entrances. Also placing the parking lot in a place where it is convenient for cars to turn into and avoid delays and traffic from the intersection. Group two chose to make the secondary entrance lead into the seating tables of the coffee shop first, while group one chose to make the secondary entrance lead into the counter of the coffee shop before the seating tables, because some people like to grab coffee first and then find seats. Group one placed the gallery according to the direction or location of the sun in order to avoid the reflection the sun reflects off the artwork. Both groups wanted to take advantage of the grade change so he placed an outdoor program on the east side of the site in order for people to have a nice view. And group two also placed a lounge on the left side for the same reason. Hi, I'm Joe from the construction management team. Um, our virtual meetings began with combining plan the plans from the three different SERP proposals, which you can see here. Uh, to begin, we found similar features of all the three designs and determined which features we wanted to keep and which features could be removed. And then after this, we combined the three schedules and determined which phases could be removed. And finally, we scheduled the phases to overlap when possible to keep the impact of construction on the surrounding area minimal. I'm Will, and I worked on the construction management virtual meetings. And after all of the CERT projects were combined, an earned value chart was created by inputting the total cost and the time period that is required. And this gives the client an estimate of the cost of certain tasks, the time required, and the rate of expenditure. This is very helpful because it provides the owner with how much funding would be required for each step of the construction. To begin the uh, construction management, virtual construction tours. We saw three different tours. Um, Highline High School, where we got to see many different phases of construction, including demolition, slab on grade preparation, uh, the elevation of slab on metal deck, masonry, fireproofing, and MEP rough-in and interior build-out. The second construction site we saw was the Seattle University Center for Science and Innovation Building. One interesting thing here is that the soil on the site was unstable, and to remedy this, geopiers were installed, uh, where a hole is drilled in the ground to reach stable soil, and then filled with rock and compacted to ensure a good foundation. The final virtual construction tour was the Nexus Building in Seattle. 
Um, in this tour, we, will, we were able to see a time lapse from the very beginning of construction, setting the foundation to the almost finished product. Thank you everyone for watching our presentation uh, from a Seattle Tuesday Team One. Uh, have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Phil and Sage and Sarah to ask a couple of questions. Well, I guess first, I spend a lot of time at the Ballard Locks with little kids and strollers. So I really appreciate the idea of expanding the walkways uh, because it's impossible to move around there. So one, I'd just say the teams did awesome. I mean, you guys clearly did a lot of research. I appreciated that you guys were on the site there day and night uh, to really observe um, what happens there. And it looks like you even met with operations um, of the site so you can understand how it's operated. Um, <clears throat> I guess, one of the questions I had, and I really love the, the increased lighting that you put in, um, but um, one of the questions I had surrounded uh, around the dome, so the dome and the wedge, um, I was thinking for a while there was something missing about, you know, besides pedestrian pathway and bikes, really enjoy being out on the lock and having a picnic in the grass there, and then you guys introduced the dome with the amphitheater and the cafe and stuff. I really like that. My question is, did you consider opening that dome so it wasn't covered and people could enjoy the locks uh, sitting outside a bit in the amphitheater? Do we have anybody from that team? Someone from the uh, architecture cert team? Gabe or Laura or Julius, for example? Um, I didn't personally work on the dome project, but from my experience with talking with people working on the dome project, I think the thought was to have certain parts of it open air um, and like open for in entrance and exiting, but I'm not sure if the entire part of the dome was meant to be that way. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with Phil. Um, I think it was a really, really well thought out series of design. Um, I appreciate the amount of decision making and kind of the process that you went through to get to that point. Um, I think that my question, one of my questions was, there seemed to be a lot of focus on the, the impact to the environment, which is awesome. Um, both from the construction scheduling time and also how you're going to handle bringing in new bio treatments. Um, and one of my questions was actually around increasing the lighting near the water. And if you had um, thought about how that might impact the, the fish in the water. I know that when they did the stuff down Town, there was a whole bunch of study around that and I was just curious if you guys had a chance to study that or how that impact would change it. Um, I can try and answer this one but the light fixture that we chose uses LED technology which doesn't like light pollute as far as distance as other lighting in different color spectrums. So what we were doing would be way helpful for the wildlife and a lot more eco-friendly. Awesome. Nice. Well, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit. Um, gosh, I mean, I think every time I watch these presentations, I'm just blown away by them. And I hope you guys as students are aware that not all students are doing this kind of thing. And uh, what you've done is really, really impressive. Um, I've, you know, been in kind of your shoes or, or walking through this from the mentor side of things and seeing all that you've got in there is um, really well thought out. And I feel like, God, you must have spent a long time sitting at those locks. I know, you know, I saw that a bunch of you guys are from Ballard High School and, and um, Roosevelt. So it's kind of your neighborhood, but it felt like to me, having been at those locks quite a few times and walking my kids and letting them roll down the hills and go into the fish ladder that you guys kind of understood the needs of, of the site. Like, like Phil said, walking across 
you know, being a constraint point. Um, you know, I've stood out there on those locks and in the rain when I really would enjoy a little canopy. Uh, you know, so anticipating kind of those types of needs is, you know, impressive. Um, I think you guys did a really, really good time. I'm, I'm um, interested to kind of hear a little bit more about where that hydraulic um, mechanism to kind of expand the walkway on the locks came from and how you came up with that idea. Yeah, I can take your question on that one. So um, we basically wanted three different layers of pathway to all align in kind of a column when the gate is in like the stowaway mode so the boats can go through. Um, so there's like, I think we kind of just like guesstimated like six or eight inches in between each slab um, just to have like a scissor mechanism and then the hydraulic system in there to like push outwards and then the scissors to move it up. Cool. I, I would be also uh, should be criticized as a structural engineer if I didn't comment on moving to the, the bridges portion. I, I really liked the the bridge that you guys had there proposed as the, the fish kind of concept and the, the way you showed the forces moving around the bridge. That makes a whole lot of sense. And I like the idea of uh, how you separated uh, the different uses in the bridge as well. I think you did a great job in kind of separating, you know, a commuter bridge, which the purpose of that person, right, is to move forward, get through there as quick as possible versus the meandering tourists that can go down into the ecosystem a bit more. You guys did a great job. Yeah, I, Sage, I totally agree. I had written down um, specifically that I thought it was great how many different user types were um, addressed in the various design opportunities. Um, I think especially in places like the locks where you have people coming for all different reasons, it totally impacts the design. And I truly appreciated the way that that was legible in each of your designs and also the way that you spoke about it. I have to say, I think you guys did a really great job presenting your ideas clearly. And um, that communication skill is imperative regardless of what field you go into, but it also helps everybody understand how intentional you are about it. So serious kudos on that front. I did have one question for the architecture team on the CERT competition, and I was just curious kind of what drove your programming decisions? As far as what kinds of uses to put into the buildings. Are you talking yes. about the dome? Uh, the dome or the wedge? Oh. Um, uh, as w I was sort of doing a lot of landscape and figuring things out, but based on what I remember, one of the reasons that we, um, one of the things for the function for the wedge was the visitor center moving it over. Uh, one of the reasons behind that was because the visitor center, the current visitor center, is very out of the way and sort of back in a bunch of bushes. So it's not as obvious sometimes, except for the sign that they put out on the walkway. That was one of the reasons for that function of the new building. Cool. There's a question in the Q&A panel that says, how were you able to decrease light pollution while also increasing the brightness of the lights in the area they cover? Does anybody do with light with that? <clears throat> I think Perrin could field that one again. Yeah, sorry. I, um, I kind of just talked a little bit about how the light fixture choice that we chose was all based around using LED technology, which doesn't light pollute as far like as far distance as other light options that we looked at. We really compared to see what would have the least impact on the environment. So I guess I got another one. I really um, love the redesign of the estuary and the fish ladder. <clears throat> I think that is super important for that area and something that's missing and definitely wasn't considered at all long ago. Um, but I would say that one of the things that my kids really love and I love to do is take them to the fish ladder so you can actually be within three inches of a giant 
king salmon going up the fish ladder. Um, and I know that's not natural or sustaining and it's, it's not great for the fish. And so part of your design was considering that and changing it more to a natural estuary and a natural fish ladder. I, with the visitor center over there, how did you consider or what did you consider for kind of that um, educational part of people getting to experience and see the fish run up the ladder or run up the estuary? I don't know that we have any students here that work directly on that part of the project tonight. Um, so I might have to I'll field an answer for them. Um, I think they uh, really dove into the ecological aspect of it. And uh, the main thing that they thought about the visitor center was uh, by moving it to the ad current administration building, which is the larger historic building. Um, they would have more room to have uh, better exhibits that uh, you might see and uh, other visitor centers at parks and national parks that were mentioned as they were talking about this. They didn't really have a lot of time to dive into the programming of that, but I think they thought that uh, seeing the fish moving through a more natural, naturalized environment would uh, be an education in itself of how we uh, have an impact on, uh, on, the, on the natural environment um, with our intrusions. <laughs> yeah. Right. We have one more question from the from the audience about the increased facility. If you're thinking of this Ballard Locks area having more events, did anybody consider parking needs? I think that goes to the architecture team mostly again. So uh, Gabe, Julia, Salora. Uh, hi, this is Julius. Um, I do uh, I do not remember us uh, addressing at any point the parking situation uh, at the locks. Um, as I remember correctly, it, based on my experience at the locks, a lot of the time the tourists that come through come on buses and are usually uh, part of large groups that go through the locks. And so individual people that go through the locks, there is parking, small amounts of parking on the Ballard side. But with that, within our analysis, we did not address the need for a lot more parking. That's a really good question because that's the other thing that we struggle with with the little kids coming from Kenmore is we probably usually have to park three blocks away in the residential neighborhood somewhere and schlep everybody down there. So uh, it would be nice if, if it's opened up on the, on the Magnolia side to have some additional parking there to access or something. That's a good one. I feel the pain. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Mark and I, we should. We are going to move on. Mark Kinsman and I are gonna go through the effort of moving the Tuesday Team 1 students down to be attendees, and we're gonna move the Tuesday Team 3 students up to be panelists. So Mark, why don't you take um, Tuesday 1 and move them down? and I'll take Tuesday three and move them up. Sound good? That'll just take a second, or a little bit of a second. So. Thanks again, Tuesday one, that was great. Yep, nice job, guys.
I think we almost got everybody. Um, I want to introduce Eric Loftus with KPFF. He's the team leader for the um, Tuesday team number three. Eric, do you want to say a quick something and introduce your team? Sure. I think my students are all here too. I'm doing a headcount right now in the in the participant list. Um, so on behalf of mentors and myself on our team, um, congratulations to our students. You guys did an awesome job this year. And like Angela mentioned earlier on, um, this was a year like any other for school and for ACE as well. And I'm sure you guys found that this was a year that required more flexibility and commitment than most years do. But you know what? You guys stepped up to the challenge and we're really proud of you and what you accomplished this year. And you should be really proud of yourselves too and hope your parents and everybody else on the call here sees that tonight. Um, so before I turn it over to Mark for a, a hitting the play button, I'll mention that after the video plays, one student wants to mention a couple words of acknowledgement after the video is done before Q&A starts. So I'll prompt when that time comes. But with that, let's roll it. Let's roll. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ACE 2019-2020 project. This year, we came together to create our performance hall, Captured Sound, a community space for music, productions, and all forms of expression. We wanted to create a building that was a physical representation of the art that it houses. With the combined skills of architecture, construction, and electrical, structural, and mechanical engineering, we began the design process as a full cohort and then split off into our respective disciplines for a more detailed design process. And with all of these skills, Captured Sound was born. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Early in the year, we did some team building activities to get to know each other and to learn about the science of constructions and engineering and to develop our drawing skills. For example, we used Django blocks to do a 3D visualization on paper, which is in two dimensions. It can get quite difficult to understand what a building looks like in two dimensions. So a 3D, uh, 3D, 3D event, the visualization can be helpful. It was also interactive to do a bingo kind of event to learn everyone's name. As we began to understand the interrelationship of our building's form and systems with the project requirements, the design began to take shape. Hi, I'm Olivia and welcome to the architecture group. Hello, I'm Meryl. I'm a 14 freshman and I go to Seattle Prep. I'm Elsa Austinson. I go to Garfield High School. I'm Olivia. I'm a senior at Garfield. I'm Jack, and I'm a senior at Redmond High School. I'm Blake, and I'm a junior at Seattle Prep. I'm Margo, and I'm a junior at Seattle Prep. I'm Michaela, and I'm a sophomore at Center School. Our team chose to work in the architecture discipline for many reasons. Most notably, we all have a passion for design and creating spaces that foster community. Additionally, many of us were inspired by family members and enjoy having a sense of control of your Okay, our building revolved on form and so we, this, we needed to make a statement through open spaces and fancy looks. Through this design, we also incorporated community areas, nature-friendly roofs, and cool fountains. We wanted the theater to be as visible as possible. So th this is um, our <clears throat> main decision-making process. The general concept for a performance hall started with a cuboid shape. Then we incorporated a partial spherical cutout positioned in the side facing the waterfront, acting as the ground floor entrance. We also incorporated a wraparound stair system, which gives public roof access and connects to Pike Place. One of the most important things we had to consider was our performance hall's location. And so in the top left diagram, we mapped out how important locations in relation to the performance hall, such as other nearby performance halls, the aquarium and pike place. Additionally, in the bottom left diagram, we mapped out the connection to the water our building's location provides. We also made note of the views nearby buildings afforded ours, which can be seen in the right hand diagram. In these two diagrams, we mapped out how our performance hall is accessible to people. In the diagram on the left, nearby roads are mapped out, along with the Elliott Bay Trail, a path for bikers and pedestrians. The diagram on the right is the people flow. It shows how people can move to and from Pike Place as well as down to the waterfront through the stairwell and roof connection. It also shows how the entrance to our building from the waterfront and at the Elliott Bay Trail. Here we have a diagram for the roof. Uh, we tried to make it as community centered as possible with a big open area and a stage and many sound on. We also tried to predict where greenery might affect our building and we tried to make connections between the market and our building as the market is very important. To, to begin our building 
concept. We tried to make it through uh, like three to um, styrofoam balls, and we tried to shape it into our into what we thought the building would look like. The building that won was the bottom left with the with the blue design and the, the hole in the wall. These are some of our preliminary design concepts made from magazine cuttings. We wanted to create a space that was elegant, light-filled, and embraced the nature around it, most notably Puget Sound. As you can see, a lot of our preliminary design concepts were reflected in our interior and exterior inspiration. Wishing to combine the grandeur of more famous performance halls while avoiding the stuffiness that could come with, we gravitated towards more modern open spaces with large windows. The rooftop deck was also a main feature of our building, so the inclusion of greenery and seating areas were highly important. These aerial site photos show how our building is a central location for both downtown and the waterfront. These site plans also show our general setting and how our site is the ideal location to serve as a connection between Pike Place and the waterfront. The first step in the process of designing our building was deciding what we wanted on each floor, then creating basic layouts. One of the most important decisions we made about the layout was where to put the theater because we needed to block off that space on the first three floors. For the rooftop, we tried out a few different layout options. We knew we wanted an amphitheater and some market stalls, so those are included in both drawings. The final design looks more like the drawing on the left with a central amphitheater with, more, with extra seating and social space surrounding it. For the exterior materials, we decided on concrete and glass as the main materials. We also decided on having some kind of exterior art and a green, with a green wall to connect our building to Pike Place even more and to set it apart from the other buildings on the waterfront. The basic layouts of our floor plan portray our desire to have many open seating areas to promote community. The first floor plan also shows how we plan to incorporate plants into the setting of our building. Level 3 and 4 are very similar to the first two floors, except level 4 has an addition of a restaurant. We have seating along the glass windows in order to embrace the view. The final plan for the rooftop deck includes an amphitheater for smaller performances, market stalls, a seating area, and beautiful views of the water our building looks down upon. A natural flow of visitors was super important to our design, so the rooftop deck acts as a sort of connector piece between the Pike Place Market and the performance hall. All of these details would be accompanied by fairy lights and sunshades for added ambiance. For the north elevation, which is the side facing Pike Place, we included high windows to let in natural light without forcing the people inside to stay at a parking garage. For the east elevation, the main material is concrete, and then the colors represent a mural that would be done by a local artist. The south elevation is the front of the building, so there are large windows looking out towards the Puget Sound, and the material is a reflective ripple metal. Finally, the west elevation has the stairs from Pike Place, and below the stairs is the green wall, and above the stairs will be another art, on, art installation. Um, so we pulled in outside materials um, that we had seen around Seattle. So stuff like wood and blue tones, and we wanted to include that in um, the building. So uh, lots of our flooring is wood um, and uh, there's a lot of blue tones um, for like the flooring in the theater and such. Um, we were also looking at doing a green wall inside because we wanted to bring the uh, outside uh, green that we were doing on the outside of the building in, and we thought it would look really cool on the inside of the building. Similar story here. So we, uh, instead of the green wall though, we did a, a wood paneling, I think is what it is, and we're gonna paint it and have it fade out as to not have people led down the hall where we don't really want them. Um, so yeah, um, and then we rendered them. So uh, we wanted to make it, we wanted to see what it would look like when it was uh, finished. So the two pictures are different angles of the first floor um, in the commons area right outside the theater. And then the, the one on the left is the theater rendering. So, um, yeah, and then the one on the right is the third floor rendering, I think. These exterior sketches highlight the landscape and design details of our building. The top image shows the staircase leading down to the waterfront, hugged by rolling hills, green hills to promote a more natural environment. A mural on the side adds life and would most likely be commissioned by a local artist. The bottom image shows the front of the building. Again, rolling hills would provide an element of privacy and mystery to the building, but also welcoming as visitors wind their way to the center plaza. 
Plants and a water feature add to the experience. With the top view of our building, you can again see those rolling hills that, with a paved path, planters, and water feature. The rooftop deck would also be equipped with various landscape details, such as trees and shrubbery. The bottom image shows our concept for the stairs. A normal staircase, but divided with strips of planters down the middle, these boxes would contain various succulents and grasses. The design would create a more streamlined flow of movement, as well as adding a fun element of surprise to the main walkway. Hi, everyone. With these following slides, you will see a digital view of our performance hall. This gives you a new and detailed representation of our concept. We will be moving from large to small scale. Starting with this slide, you see the aerial view to show what captured sound will be in relation to Seattle downtown. Next to it is the front view, which shows the unique glass structure. With this slide, you see the front of the structure as a whole with the lower promenade, reflection pond, glass structure, public green space, stairs, and rooftop. Here we go closer, where you see the green rooftop with its outdoor amphitheater and cafe that offers world-class urban and nature views. Now we move even more in depth with a view of the lower promenade from the inside and an experience of walking up the stairs. Moving on from the digital realm, we now see a 3D printed version of our design. The best design uses every method available from paper to high tech, which is exactly what we did to provide you a physical representation of our design in its most simplest form. Thank you. The structural team is responsible for keeping the building intact. And this is our group. Hello, my name is Oliver and I'm a sophomore at O'Day. My name is Nathan and I'm a junior at O'Day. My name is Ben and I'm a junior at Mercer Island High School. And my name is Marcel and I'm a senior at O'Day. So for our design overview, so we have the blob, which is the big open space on the corner of our building. The roof of the block acts as a one huge cantilever, which is supported by the steel trusses. These long steel trusses span across between levels four and five. We also choose a steel frame building for this design because it is earthquake resistant. It is also a popular choice among many skyscrapers due to its sound technique. The techniques use a uh, skeletal framing, which uses steel beams and comes in a rectangular manner. The problem with this design is that it loses or gain uh, heat 300 to 400 times quicker than wood. Uh, this makes a uh, wall insulator 60% less effective. Uh, level one, we choose concrete flooring for all the levels. We also have concrete and steel pile caps so the building does not move as much during an earthquake. This can be seen on the level one schematic with the squares. Uh, level two, we have a big open space on the lower left of the schematic that represent our performance hall. The big open space will have limited support of uh, beams and columns as the hall scales multiple levels. This supports a performance hall, and we also use bigger columns surrounding the performance hall. Uh, for level four, we have a long steel truss that span across level four and five to support the blob. And for level five, which is our highest level, we have an amphitheater on the roof, so we'll visual due to the presence of people and such equipment. This means we'll have to use bigger beams. On top of that, we have a cantilever that is on the roof of the blob. To support this, we use a long span steel trusses. There are two types of structural loads, lateral loads and vertical loads, and we have two systems to deal with these loads. Wind loads are wind pushing against the building, and earthquake loads are the stress the building undergoes during an earthquake, while dead loads are the weight of objects inside the building, including the building weight itself. On the other hand, live loads are people or animals weight on the vertical system, and snow loads are like dead loads and live loads, except they are the snow's weight on the system. Structural design philosophy is based on four things. First, it is based on the design objective of the architects. A good example of this is the truss we have in our building, which we would not need if the architects did not want the giant glass blob. Second is accounting for loads, and this is talking about the structural loads I previously mentioned. Third is accounting for failures, and this refers to structural members in both the lateral and vertical systems. And lastly, accounting for worst scenarios. This means that if we are choosing the size of a beam, we increase the expected force on this beam to ensure safety. For column failures, there is buckling, which is seen in the bottom left image. And for beam failures, there is shearing, which is seen in the bottom right image. It is a horizontal failure. Moment failure, lateral torsional buckling, which is seen in the top right image, and deflection. For truss failures, there's compression, and tension yield, or rupture. So in order to create the form of the building, we need to design beams and columns. Um, so there are many ways in which to go about designing beams and columns within a building. In order for the structure to remain standing, the total load of the building must be considered. 
and applied to what beams and columns to use. The first step is to calculate the loads and then compare them to beam and column member designs. So in order to compare our load to and decide on a design for a beam, there are pre-calculated um, beam and design books that we use to select the best type of beam for what we needed to do. So for the foundation, um, we're using a pile and pile cap system. So a pile cap is a thick concrete mat that rests on a concrete or timber pile that has been driven into soft or unstable ground in order to provide a suitable, stable foundation. We decide to use this form because the soil around where our amphitheater is is very unstable because of its proximity to the Puget Sound. And so the way these piles will fortify our building is they will drill down to bedrock or another stable sediment and then we'll put piles on top of the pile caps on top of the piles in order to put the load structure on top of that. And um, basically we're using this because it's effective and um, due to the instability of the landscape we're building upon. One thing that structural engineers must account for when designing a building are lateral loads. These lateral loads can be caused by a variety of factors, from wind to earthquakes. Earthquakes generate seismic forces as a result of the movement of tectonic plates. This can lead to a collapse in buildings not designed to handle the unexpected stress. How do we account for these lateral forces? We employ many different strategies in order to counteract these forces. For example, our building uses moment frame beams in order to account for the large open area of the performance hall. How do we design a truss that can support our building's key architectural feature? The steel truss we have decided upon spans across the roof of our building and through the corner, supporting the live and dead loads present on the roof of this glass feature, preventing it from breaking under stress. Hey, so we are the mechanical engineering team. I'm Tyler. I'm a junior that goes to Inglemore. And we are in charge of the heating, ventilation, air conditioning of the building to make sure that the people inside are comfortable. So here is our one line diagram. It essentially gives you a good idea of how air will flow through the building. So first the air will go in through the air handling it through the supply air route. It will pass through the heating coils and cooling coils and you can turn either one on to heat or cool the building. It will then pass through a filter to get rid of any allergens. It will go through the filter in order to get rid of any like impurities in the air. It enters the building through the supply air vents. People breathe it in and once the air gets stale it is then returned through the red vents to the exhaust fan and ejected out of the building. Uh, and then for this building in particular, we will also have a amenities exhaust air handling unit. This is for especially stinky areas such as the bathrooms or the concession stands. So this is floor one of the theater. This is the main HVAC map. The blue piping is for the supply air. This will give air to the occupants at from outside. Uh, the pink tubing is represented for return air. This is to get all the stale air out. And the green piping is for the uh, amenities exhaust that will exit the building through the smelly areas. You can see it in the concessions and the restroom areas. Uh, some key things that we put in this building in particular are the architectural chase the low wall return grill and the elevator mechanical rooms. Uh, we'll start off with the architectural chase. This is mainly a space where we put all of our main ventilation. Uh, this is used to leave a space for all the big ventilation tubes running through the building. Uh, you can see it in the top right corner. Uh, the low wall return grill is used to prevent stratification in the main theater room. Because the main theater room is so high, 
uh, pockets of air can get trapped in there and create unevenness in the heating and cooling. So we use a low wall return grill to combat that. And lastly is the elevator mechanical and ventilation. You can see this in the black boxes near the elevators. This is mainly because elevators need their own ventilation, cooling, and other mechanical structures. Finally, this is the roof. This is where we keep all the big air handling units for the majority of the building. Uh, one thing to note here is the spacing requirements needed. This is because you don't want other air handling units sucking in the exhaust of another. So in order to get fresh air, you need the air handling units a certain distance apart. And then we also have the central concessions exhaust fans on the vestibule. Hello, we're the electrical team. We consist of Riley Kahn, Felicia, and myself, Ben Solom. Today, we're going to talk to you about the electrical features in the theater as well as the entire building. For my part, I'll be talking about AV or more commonly said audiovisual. Audiovisual consists of everything you can see and hear inside and outside the premises of the building. On this slide is the first floor of the building, which consists of the ticket booth, concessions, and theater. For both the ticket booth and concession stand, we have digital signage, a way of advertising using screens that rotates images from food items to ticket prices. We also have a big digital signage screen outside the building for advertising. That's simple. The theater, on the other hand, is a little more complex. The theater needs to be able to have a good output of sound for all spectators to hear. That's why the massive speaker arrays are included in the theater. Those are connected to a mixer, which affects the sound. Then that output goes into an amplifier to conserve the signal. We also made sure to include lighting all over the theater so the spectators can see what they're hearing. This will create a great atmosphere for any spectator. This slide consists of the AV for the third floor. We wanted to make sure the guests felt comfortable and welcome to the space they were in. For the marketplace and open area, we had Bluetooth speakers around the open area to set the tone of the space and make sure all feel welcome. For the bathrooms, we also provided Bluetooth speakers. Finally, for the theater, we had the obvious lighting and speakers, as well as an amplifier rack, which powers the speakers. More on that later. This basically summarizes the third floor. For sound reinforcement, we wanted to make sure that a tiny sound, like our voices, go big through speakers to get to all the spectators. As you can see, the first sound goes through the microphone, which goes into a mixer, which controls the level of the sound. After that, it goes into an amplifier, which takes all the direct connections together as one signal. Basic concept, if you need anything electrical, you need power. That power goes right into the stage lights, which turns it on. Also, the lighting control controls the level of light, such as the brightness and color. The control switch is what brings down the projector screen. You also need a projector to get images onto the screen. And to get those images, you're going to need a computer to store them onto the projector then the projector onto the screen. Finally, for the digital signage, all you need is power to power the screen and a server to provide the images onto the digital screen. All right, guys, I'm gonna be talking about the lights. Um, so starting off with the stairwell and storage lighting and the restroom lighting. The stairwell storage lighting, we decided to go with a strip light with a wraparound lens, just to give an overall bright feel. And for the restroom side, use a vanity above the mirrors with a warm white light. To, which normally goes to the bathroom feel. So for the dining lighting, we did an architectural pendant. And then for the concessions lighting, we said to use a spotlight on a track system to point out all the uh, different food items. And then for the food service and the back of the house lighting, we said to use recessed panel lighting so it wouldn't get in the way of cleaning and it'd be super easy to, and be super bright to cook, see what you're doing. For the lobby lighting, we said to use architectural pendants of different types to give people kind of a more modern feel of the area. And we also said to use surface mounted drum lighting to help with the overall um, light of it. The room, considering the arc windows won't, won't produce enough light to cover the entire area. And then for the ticket booth, you said use sconce lights, which are the ones you, you just hang on the wall. For the theater seating, we did, for the aisles, you said to use recessed wall mounted aisle lighting, which you normally see in movie theaters and 
other theaters. And then we also had to use overhead square pendant lighting with the once again going with that modern feel. And then also going with the movie theater type feel with the wall mounted sconce. For the exterior lighting around the bistro area, we had said had the bistro lights. Also the exterior area outside the bistro, we said to have bollard lighting to give it, once again, stay at the modern feel. And then we said to go with the pole lights that look, that had a resemblance to the bollard lights. For the lighting controls, the blue areas show where we chose to use time clock, which sets the lights to be on at certain times. And these are in the public spaces so that the lights are on during open hours. The green areas are where we chose to put occupancy sensors, which turn the lights on when the space is occupied. And these are in stairwells and food prep area for safety reasons, and also in less used spaces where people might be during odd hours like backstage. The hatched areas are for daylight sensing, and that senses the amount of daylight coming in and adjusts the light level accordingly. These are in areas near windows in accordance with the Seattle Energy Code. The pink area on the roof is the photo control with dimming after hours in accordance with the Seattle Energy Code section on outdoor areas. So for the receptacle layout, floors one, two, and three are very similar. So we just had one layout for all three floors. The overall layout is on the left and there are some zoomed in images on the right. In the middle are the concessions and ticket booth um, the concessions and ticket booth both have receptacles designated specifically for digital signage. And on the far right is the theater and backstage where there are receptacles designated for speakers and various pieces of sound equipment. All the other receptacles are placed every 30 to 50 feet, which is standard. So we then used the receptacle layout and counted receptacles to input the quantity of receptacles in our load calculations and multiplied that by 180 watts. Then we added the watts for the special equipment that were pointed out in the last slide and used the equation of P equals I times V and rearranged it to calculate for the current where P is power in watts, V is voltage, which is either 120, 208 volts for receptacles or 277, 480 volts for lighting. And the reasons for these different voltages is because um, for large loads, we want to have a decreased current so that we can make panels and wires smaller. So we calculated um, the current, which is I, and that's in amps. And then we then divided by three because we went with a three phase system for our electrical, electrical system. So then we repeated the process for this receptacle layout for floor four and the roof. There is an overall layout for floor four on the far left with a zoom in of the cafe and food prep area in the mid left. There are specially designated receptacles for kitchen appliances there. And on the right is the overall layout for the roof with a zoom in of an outdoor amphitheater area mid right with specially designated receptacles for speakers and sound equipment. And again, all the other receptacles are placed every 30 to 50 feet. So then we just repeated the process as the load calculations for floors one, two, and three for floor four and the roof. Then we use the information from the load calculations to create a one-line diagram, which shows the power flow of the building's electrical system. Um, we showed how many amps are needed to support the loads on each floor and how we have separate panels for different voltages. They all feed to the main service panel, which is 277, 480 volts to be able to support both voltages of panels and also showed how we need transformers for the 120 to 8 volt panels so that they can be compatible with the larger voltage of the main service panel. And on the left are just some example pictures of what a circuit panel and transformer might look like. Uh, hey, my name is Luke. I'm a 17 year old junior and currently attend O'Day High School. My name is Michael and I'm also a junior at O'Day High School. As the construction management team, we are responsible for how the building will be built, how long it will take and how much it will cost. This is the, slight, the site layout plan. On the job site, we will, need to, uh, we will need a lay down area without interrupting the building area, which is the pink outlined area. We will need somewhere to uh, put for our lay down area for storage, um, for our job site trailers and other various things. 
After a job site visit via Google Earth, we saw that Pine Street on the left side is closed um, because it is used for a parking garage uh, into the neighboring building. Therefore, we can't use that street um, for more space. We then decided to rent space from the parking lot on the opposite side. Inside the extra space includes our job site trailers, COVID safety equipment, for example, masks are required while on the job site, um, social distancing, and you need to fill out a questionnaire just to confirm that you don't have any symptoms of the coronavirus. There are also bathrooms with uh, cleaning equipment if you need to sanitize yourself. Since we are building so close to the water, there is also ba Baker tank filtration systems that filters the runoff from the project to prevent pollution into the ocean. We can utilize this extra space to put a central crane that can reach the most amount of space with its radius, including the load and unload area from the trucking route. Um, this also makes erecting and disassembling the crane much easier and cheaper. Pedestrians also need to be kept safe through the building process so we will be redirecting pedestrians to cross the street at the spot marked with the little red line on the far right side of the PowerPoint. Doing so will minimize potential pedestrian danger and injury. Developing a trucking route for deliveries is extremely important for the efficiency of a construction site. For our trucking route, we took a pretty simple approach. We wanted a, a route from one major highway to another major highway that limits the time the trucks spend on small city streets. The red square near the beginning of the route represents our site. The trucks will get off of Highway 99 onto Alaskan Way heading northbound. As you can see in the previous slide, there's an offloading area out of the way of traffic that the trucks will pull off of into. From there, the trucks will continue north on Alaskan Way to I-5. This is our project schedule. The bold black titles are the main events. So for the Ace Waterfront redevelopment, development. Um, the total project will take about two to two and a half years um, or for each one it will take uh, 290 days for the pre-construction and design phase. That's 290 working days. Um, note that each red title um, is a critical path and can't be pushed back or it will affect the finish date. The blue titles are milestones which have no start or end dates and it, doesn't, it also doesn't have a duration. It's just something that happens and allows you to move on to the next thing. Once we start construction, we will have a notice to proceed and that will allow us to start building the building. Certain things will overlap, allowing us to complete multiple projects at once. Doing so will allow us to finish the project faster than uh, waiting for one thing to finish um, to start the next. After we erect the entire building and uh, build the curtain wall on the outside, um, we can start on the roof and the MEP rough-in, which is the plumbing and electrical systems and whatnot. Um, and then we can start the interior framing and walling and finishes, allowing us to start the theater build out, which will take 150 days of those 274 days um, to put up the lighting and drapery along with the, <clears throat> along with the seating and the stage construction. The project will be complete 564 days after starting. We began our project estimate by thinking about the general condition costs. Our unit cost was found in units of months. Essentially, how much money will be spent for how long we are on site. This usually includes things like trailers, site management, material handling, and project management. For the majority of the costs, we simply found the cost per square foot and calculated the number of square feet for that particular line item. For the steel estimate, we referenced drawings we received from the structural team and found the approximate cost per beam. Finally, we found our contingency, which was just 3% of the total cost. And this is basically just extra money for any costs that are not already accounted for. After some simple addition, we arrived at our approximate total cost of just over $26 million. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
say you had a student who wanted to say something? Yes, so let the test and I go over to Olivia, please. Hi everyone, I'm Olivia. Thank you so much for uh, listening to our presentation. So we as a team wanted to recognize that as architects, we both create and take up space, space that is most often steeped in the racist and marginalizing past and present of our country. As residents of Seattle, we want to acknowledge that we are on Coast Salish land, more specifically that of the Duwamish tribe. With great respect, we honor both this traditional land as well as the Duwamish people themselves. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you. Okay, I will turn the time over to our panelists who can take a few minutes to ask some questions. Well, first I would say that was awesome, amazing. I mean, the detail you guys put into it, the architecture team with the renderings, the, the virtual models, the 3D printed models, I mean, really made me feel like I could imagine being down on the waterfront and see the building. Really great job. Structural team too. My background before a general contractor is structural steel. And I wrote down some questions beforehand, especially on your moment frames or whether you were gonna use BRBs and you answered all those questions. Mm -hmm. Really amazing. I think somebody um, from the audience asked about um, cantilevering and making sure that you carry those in your structural system for those long spans, which I'm sure you had in there. So really amazing. And then the MEP electrical, I mean, just every detail you guys did awesome so I guess a couple things I would have <clears throat> and I'll start with one question and then turn it over to everybody else so they can ask them too but um, on the construction side um, I did notice in your schedule you had shoring and you had baker tanks um, for dewatering and after you know Mortensen just completed the um, the whole seawall reconstruction downtown I know that soil in that area and I know that it's very contaminated. And so my question was, how did you guys consider dewatering for your shoring system and contamination filtration before it went into the Baker tanks and back into the system? Um, I'd say, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, so uh, basically our plan was to, um, when we're digging out uh, to lay the foundation of the building, um, our plan is to pump out water into those, into those tanks and then um, essentially preventing from runoff and um, uh, caving back in of the, of the hole. And then once they're in those, those tanks, we can then uh, truck them off site. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would follow up after Phil and say that was another really great presentation. Um, I think it's really fascinating the different ways that you were trying to reach and connect to nature and connect to the existing kind of tourist realm that's already down there at the waterfront. Um, one of my questions was the area that you had a chunk taken out of the building with the big glass feature was super cool. And I was curious if there was any thought about providing performance space in the leftover plaza outside of that. Um, I think part of that space we wanted to use um, for seating. So not necessarily performance space, but just space that people can congregate before going into shows or just hang out if they're just passing by. But that is a really good idea that we actually put um, some picnic tables and couches in front of that area to um, give a nice view out onto the other side and such. Yeah, it just looked like a really great opportunity and, and a place where if you didn't have something that was a full stage size, maybe they could get some views behind them like you do at the court. Sage? Yeah, can, can you guys talk a little bit about uh, the modeling that you did? It, you know, you've got both the electronic modeling that you did and then the physical model, both of them were really impressive. I'm interested to know how you did it and um, what it took. Hi, so for the, the modeling process, we decided that we wanted to have a very detailed representation of our building to kind of give you that like almost real life experience. And so on the computer side, we used SketchUp to just kind of create a very simple 
kind of like building layout and then just add on like the layers with the grass and the hills. And then um, the 3D modeling, we used an online platform to kind of fine tune the, um, the glass blob structure. And then we just kind of 3D printed that at the ZGF studios. Very cool. Very nice. Yeah. I, I, um, I should question. probably oh, go, go, for go for it. Well, I was just going to say, I did that. have another question since it is a performance space. And um, I noticed that there was a question from an attendee around the acoustics for the outdoor amphitheater. And I was also curious about the acoustic design considerations, especially related to all of the mechanical air that you're having to move in and out of the big theater space. Inside. Um, we didn't, that's a really good question. We didn't actually consider the noise laws for the outside amphitheater. Um, I think what we were thinking was it would be less like super big, super loud performances. It would be more like smaller bands or like quieter bands. Um, I guess something that we could do to uh, counteract that noise would be to um, add some like soundproof material or something into the amphitheater design. And that's, um, I don't know if this answers your question, but with the inside of the theater, we most of the materials that we chose were specifically um, to help with the sound, with like cork and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I have a question for the MEP team. First, I noticed uh, you did a really good job. I noticed that when you were going through your uh, electrical loads, you were a little off on your mechanical watts calculation. No, I'm just kidding. I would have no <laughs> idea. That was pretty awesome. Um, my, <laughs> my question is, did you guys uh, talk to the city or look through the Seattle City uh, like uh, Seattle energy codes and consider the new energy codes when it came to uh, your mechanical design specifically. Anyone from the mechanical team on? I think Tyler is here. Oh. Sorry. Uh, could you repeat the question? My question is on for the mechanical systems, did you guys consider the Seattle Energy Code as you designed the system? Uh, no, we did not. Uh, I don't think we had a lot of time to communicate with a lot of the other teams, so it was a pretty isolated effort. We probably should have, in retrospect, communicated like much more with the other teams, but COVID kind of <laughs> screwed up a lot of stuff. And we actually had two members of our team just kind of ditch. So it's kind of a one man effort. So. Well, you did a great job. Thank you. Nice job. I you think, did do a good job. Um, <laughs> I think we will move on to our next presentation. Um, so that is good. Yes, Eric is clapping. Thank you. Good. Thank mm -hmm. you, Tuesday Team 3. Um, so the next presentation is our Thursday team. Um, I am going to jump into the, um, do my host stuff really fast. So Mark, will you move all of the T3s to attendees? And I'm going to go into the attendee list and move the Thursdays up. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. So. Thanks again, Team 3. That was great. Nice job. And if uh, I'm going to refill my water, I'll be back in a second. Nice job. Okay. Now I'll just hang tight. We've got one more presentation to do. Thursday, Thursday. Save the best for last, huh? Okay. Short and sweet. <laughs> All right. I've got, 
Let me go through the list one more time, see if I left anybody out. Thursday. Thursday. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Amber, do you want to give a quick um, intro to your team and then we'll get started? Hi, I'm Amber. I'm an interior designer at Gensler along with my co-leader Sebastian. Um, we had a really great year adapting to working virtually and our students really stepped up to the challenge. Um, they're really passionate about meeting every week. Um, sometimes they didn't wanna get off the calls. <laughs> um, so thank you students and parents. Um, you should be really proud of what we accomplished. So here's a look at our final presentation called Urban Ascent. Hi, my name is Isabella, and I'm a senior at Highline Big Picture High School. I'm Flora, and I'm a senior at Tesla STEM High School. Hi, I'm Luke, and I'm a sophomore at Roosevelt High School. Hi, I'm Priya, and I'm a junior at University Prep. Hi, I'm Johanna, and I'm a senior at Shorewood High School. Hi, I'm Hui, and I'm a senior at Tesla STEM High School. Our team chose plot A at Alaskan Way and Pine Street for a feasibility study. This is a great opportunity for renovation due to the removal of the viaduct and has opened up a supreme plot to develop on between Seattle's infamous Pikes Place Market and the waterfront. We were asked to design a multi-purpose building with a focus on the market to connect it to the existing downtown and to the waterfront. We are limited to a three-story building that allows access to the surrounding sites and has a strong focus on creating a unique open space for anyone in the community to use. Like most newer buildings in the area, we are also required to implement sustainable building practices. While we tried to create a unique space to match the vibe of the greater Seattle area, our programs within it are quite simple. We needed to include a restaurant slash bar of up to 10,000 square feet with a full kitchen, a commercial office space divided into two main tenant spaces, and of course an open market for both local produce and merchandise. We also wanted to have a basic idea of how we would furnish the site, including the site being used for several different events and during different times of the year. At the start of our time together, we did many activities to learn about each other and about what some of the things we would be doing at ACE. These are some photos that were taken during uh, some of our first visits of the season. We are, in these photos, we are designing and building structures that must pass certain requirements and then withstand the power of a shake table. After we split into our core groups, we in architecture needed to start the design process of making the building. After reading through the RFP and doing some brainstorming, we all got a little trace paper to draw out what came to our minds. This helped us gather a general theme about what we wanted our building to look like. This then led to 3D modeling, where we all made our own ideas for the building out of styrofoam. After the model making, we needed to get some knowledge and experience from a real construction site, so we traveled to one. We visited the Pacific Place Mall that is next to the North Sturm Building. At the site, we were introduced to different architectural ideas, some of which even made it into our final building design. Our site is located at Seattle's waterfront and offers views of Puget Sound and the Olympic Mountains. We highlighted the noteworthy buildings and landmarks around our site to help us figure out how to attract people to the site. These include the Seattle Aquarium, Pike Place Market and its extension, the parking, and the waterfront condominium complex. According to the map, there are three roads near the site for vehicular circulation, Pine Street, Alaskan Way, and a road that runs directly behind the site. This means that vehicular traffic will be concentrated on the south and northwestern parts of the building, as well as the northeastern side of the building. For pedestrian circulation, the Elliott Bay Trail and any streets leading from Pike Place Market to the waterfront will allow people to get to the site on foot. We knew that there was a sort of disconnect between Pike Place Market and the waterfront, so we decided to make the site into a link for pedestrian traffic. Knowing that it plays an important role in existing buildings, we decided to take into account the climate around the site. We considered the position of the sun and the wind direction near the site when deciding on the shape and placement of the three levels in the building. This allowed us to design our passive cooling strategies around wind direction and sun positioning. 
we could account for where the most natural light comes in and which parts of, of the building would receive more cool air. During one of our meetings, students and mentors split into a few groups and gathered images of buildings to share with each other. Individual groups discussed and organized those images according to the varying aesthetics and ideas that were preferred. Then students decided what ideas we liked the most and envisioned that we would use in our project and eventually shared common ideas with the other groups. There were several common ideas that our team had for the building exterior. These ideas include garage doors to open spaces on the marketplace floor, geometric facades with unique window placement, ways to optimize views of the waterfront, lots of incorporated greenery on the building's exterior such as a green wall, and stairs that have greenery and unique step placement for potential seating. The greenery is designed to make exterior spaces equally important and vibrant as interior. Along with several ideas for the exteriors, our team also gathered several ideas for the building's interior. We wanted a casual and inviting place for people to hang out and work, simple spaces that tie together all the floor designs and create overall balance, natural materials and textured materials to avoid a plain and basic design so that we could also bring the outdoors indoors, and an environment that is welcoming to all people so that there's something for everyone to enjoy. This will further engage people in all the different experience the project has to offer. So some key ideas and concepts we wanted when brainstorming the overarching goals of the project were to connect pedestrians between Pike Place and the waterfront, showcase local makers and their craft, and having an active street at night and celebrating materials native to PNW by incorporating them into our programs and reinforcing the connections to nature. Each floor will have their own unique program. Our goal for the first floor, which is the open market space, is to be able to make use of the space for spatial, spacious circulating pedestrians, to have a nightlife, and to host a versatile of products. Some ideas were including food stands, food trucks, have local artisans sell their craft, and have seasonal variations. The second floor is the office. Our goals were to allow a diverse bundle of businesses to collaborate and create a unique environment. Some ideas were hosting new startups and craftsmen people, have an open makerspace work, here, work area, a flexible office for co-working that can be adjusted and modded in a gallery to show off individual works from different companies. Finally, the third floor is a restaurant and bar. To embody our overall goal to bring PNW natural resources to our building, we can, to, we can incorporate a green and sustainable process within the restaurant ingredients, and the restaurant will be connected to the outside. This will be done with an open kitchen, a process of farm to table, a herb garden where the restaurant will get their organic spices from, and an indoor and outdoor eating space. So we started off with the main idea of connecting the waterfront and the marketplace together. And we had a concept of using terraces facing towards the waterfront. And then we wanted to have a pathway running through the building that sort of meandered its way through so that people could pass through and experience the building more. So for our 3D modeling process, we started off working in SketchUp on different ideas for buildings that we have and modeling those. And then once we had decided on a general design for the building, we moved on to modeling that in one design and we continued to fine tune the design for that one and then we moved on to using Rhino and that's the program that we've been using since then to create the final model. These are some more high level sketches that we created to try and communicate our ideas more clearly. The first sketch was focused on how people would move up or down the exterior of the building. The second sketch was more focused on building materials and the last sketch was focused on circulation on the first floor. The interior concept image here describes the psychological feels inside each level. The third level, the restaurant, is casual and orderly. The second level, the office workspace, is a focused space that involves collaboration and supports creativity. And while the first level, the market hall, is an energetic and playful. Using this as a guide, we planned out our floor plans. So these are some of the photos we used as inspiration for our 
exterior materials and the materials we decided on were mostly wood and concrete with the pathway going through the building being concrete and having greenery throughout the building in different places on top of the restaurant and in a green wall in the marketplace. Starting off at the summit of our building is the connector bridge that'll bring pedestrians from Pike Place Market across to our building. This bridge was the way that we were able to transport people from Pike Place Market to our building, so it had many design iterations. It was settled that it would consist of a main path that connects one side of the bridge to the other, with a green space covering the rest of it. This is the view that there would be from the top of our bridge. Since our plot is conveniently located by the waterfront, there was no doubt we would take advantage of the views in our project. We designed our building to have outdoor restaurant seating so customers can enjoy the views, along with large glass windows for people inside the restaurant to also enjoy this outdoor experience. The restaurant also has access to a rooftop garden that also allows people who are in the garden to experience the views. Moving down a level from the restaurant view is the office landing. This is a small platform that connects the northern and southern facing stairs and has a large window that allows people from the office to look out at the waterfront. At the end of our staircase is our main outdoor open space that leads into the market. Greenery on the columns and the inner corner will blend the space into the surrounding area and tie the ground level to our other floors and the staircase itself. Open paths with, will allow people to travel from point A to point B directly or wander through various market stalls or art installations. Overall, we want to create something with varying activities on each floor, but with cohesion. A large stairway works its way down from floor to floor to tie everything together and provides adequate space for gathering, resting, or looking out at the view. Large green spaces wander from the very top of our building all the way to the ground level for a vertical connector and to add more nature to our city space. From this angle, you are able to see the whole building, and it contains an abundance of windows providing nice lighting. The trees borders the building, and a trail of bushes along the stairs can be seen as both a travel guide and a PNW aesthetic point. From this view, it is an important view of our bridge, and as mentioned before, it is connecting our building to the other side of the road, which is Pike Place, where a majority of our pedestrians will arrive from. In order to continue with sustainability practices, it is important for our project to have natural materials such as concrete, stone, wood, plants, rocks, and bronze metal. We also wanted bright, neutral colors to lighten up spaces and dark colors to create balance with the light colors and soft textures to bring a more comforting feel. Students sketched and formulated several floor plan ideas for each of the levels with spatial awareness in mind. By gathering and discussing these floor plans, this allowed us to create our final floor plans shown in the following slides with ideas that we liked the most and made the most sense for the different spaces. Here's a better view of our floor one floor plans for an open air market. We wanted to create a public space with both indoor and outdoor areas that would feel connected and fun. Our main idea was to create something for everyone and to be able to transform the entire space with little effort. This floor could not only be used as a market, but also for an event space, for small shows, yoga classes, or even outdoor style movies. The main features of this floor include two large garage style doors on, the both, on both the north and south sides of the building, a modular multi-purpose platform, which I will elaborate on later, and rotating art installations are also included. At our core, we have elevators for accessibility and bathrooms for users of the space. Towards the top of the diagram, there's a drop-off and pickup zone that doubles as a loading zone to encourage fewer cars and encourage foot traffic and public transportation. We designed it with focus on circulation, specifically for ride sharing. We also have included a safe bike storage area for the same reason. Here is the modular platform shown in greater detail from the previous slide. The idea is that the counter spaces for the market or for dining would be built into the floor and pulled up, sliding the legs of the table on little tracks until they are upright and clicked into place to transform into a regular table. This would allow a greater diversity of products and displays to take place in this area, as well as making it entirely flat for use as a stage, dance floor, or movie theater seating. Up to the second floor, which is our office space. This area is designed as a maker space that can be rented out to different people. The main points of focus for this floor was the collaboration of people in an environment that supports creativity. We were able to achieve this through an open floor plan that encourages collaboration while still having smaller rooms to allow for individual work within the space. The workshops within the floor plan are able to be used by many different creative disciplines like woodworking, metal shop, 
and many more through the implementation of different materials and tools. After exploring student sketches of different restaurant floor plans and gathering feedback, students ultimately finalize the space with the following in mind. Consistent seating throughout the restaurant so that the back space is more quiet and casual while the front space encourages people to enjoy the waterfront views. A bar space that can be opened up occasionally to the outdoor seating area when the weather is nice and a grab and go system that allows few people to operate the ordering counter. The outdoor group seating contributes to an overall fun restaurant vibe to ensure an open community full of interactions. Finally, the top floor of our building, our garden and bridge connection. The main points for this floor was a green space and a bridge that connects to Pike Place Market. The bridge was, was previously mentioned and the green space was created through a vegetable garden that is open to the public and looks out over the waterfront. This concludes the architecture part of our presentation. We'll now pass it off to structural engineering. Uh, my name is Jacob Berg. I'm a sophomore at Roosevelt. Uh, my name is Zach Carter Schwingler and I'm a senior at Roosevelt. For our uh, load maps, we created these um, four for each of the floors corresponding to the architectural drawings. Um, they talk about the pounds per square foot load that each of these floors and the area of the floor where it would happen. Um, we, this uses both the dead load, which is the weight of the building, and the live load, which is corresponded to like furniture and people moving around. And um, we've put the weight for each of these areas in these tables. For our materials, we chose to build our building out of steel and concrete because steel is really easy to shape into the um, design that the architects have created. It's, and concrete is really sturdy under pressure, which we're using it for a shear wall. Um, and they're both economical and they go with the building's aesthetics. And now for the structural framing specifically, we'll start with the columns. We space the columns about 30 feet apart in order to maintain stability and efficiency. We designed one column for the entirety of the structure in order to standardize the columns that we are ordering. And then we also made a conservative estimate in order to make sure that this is the most structurally sound column we could use. We did a conservative estimate based on the largest possible area the column would have the support and the largest possible load that the column would have the support. And using the map that you see on the right, we are using W12s for our column. And then we also designed beams. We designed W16s for the workspace and the restaurant area because these beams are less densely packed. And then for the stairwell, for the market space, we designed W10s because they're, they are more densely packed. And then finally, for the most unique portion of our structure, you see the 15 foot cantilever pictured in blue and uh, in order to support it, a 25 foot long backspan shown in yellow. This reduces the torque that the cantilever that the column must support and therefore also means that this beam is more structurally sound. We also made a much deeper beam using a W40 because a deeper beam means a stronger beam. Um, we had to create this cantilever due to moving these columns inward into the building because we need to preserve the view from the market space to the water. Uh, so for the foundations, we decided to do a slab on grade. Uh, when we did our calculations, we assumed 3000 PSF bearing pressure. Uh, we also use unfactored for an uh, unfactored for the base and uh, factored for the depth for our calculations. Uh, we have three different types of footings. Our biggest and thickest footing is the blue one. Uh, that one um, is right by the bridge, so it's going to help take some of the load from the bridge. Uh, and then our smallest footing are the green ones. Those are ones that are going to be supporting the cantilever. And then we have two slabs. We have an 8 inch slab for the footprint and a 12 inch slab for the marketplace. So for the lateral system, um, the reason why you have a lateral system, lateral system, uh, is to basically so it can handle the lateral forces and loads. Um, and so a real reason, a real world reason why I would have is for, uh, for example, winds and earthquakes. Um, so we live here in Seattle, we're prone to some pretty big earthquakes. And so it's important that we include a lateral system 
in our building. And you tend to want to have the system in the central part of the building. Uh, so for this structure, we decided that the core, which houses the bathrooms and the stairs, um, will be the lateral system. And so we're going to be building it out of concrete sheer walls. And we chose concrete because that sort of fits in with the uh, architecture uh, part of the building. And for the bridge, the architecture team sort of gave us uh, more freedom on um, designing the bridge. And so uh, we decided to use steel. And we use steel because uh, it's better for compression and tension. Um, and we also use a truss uh, because, again, for um, uh, compression and tension. And we wanted no columns because the bridge is going to be going over a road. And so some logistics of the of the bridge is we the truss is going to be 12, 12 feet deep uh, and this is why it's so deep because the bridge is so long the bridge is about 100 feet long and we're going to have heavy w14 sections with about 45 degree angle diagonals uh, so yeah that wraps it up for the uh for the engineering proportion next up is the construction my name is Virginia Herbord. I'm a senior at Shorewood High School. And my name is Zach Netto, and I'm a freshman at Inglemore High School. I mean, a sophomore at Inglemore High School. And now we're going to look at our site plan. The white dotted outline is our property line, and the red dotted line is the actual construction zone. The construction zone is split into two areas because there is an active road running between the two that we cannot shut down for the duration of the project. The white solid outline is our building footprint, and as you can see, our tower crane is going through the westernmost corner of the building. Due to our small site, we also have a small laydown area, which will require just-in-time delivery. Our trucks will be coming in from and going out onto Alaskan Way via the westernmost corner of our property line. Our crew entrances and exits are also on the western corner of the property, as well as the southern edge of the property. And now let's take a look at our site challenges. The main challenges that we foresee are the fact that we do have a small site, which means we'll have a limited area to perform the construction. There's also the fact that our tower crane is going through our building, which will necessitate a pour back of concrete at a later date. The bridge place, the bridge is also going over an active road, which means we will either have to shut down the road or hire people to control traffic. There's also the possibility that we'll be next to adjacent construction projects that will be going on at the same time as ours, which will mean that we cannot contemplate spilling out into the parking lot to the south of our site. We will also be next to the Puget Sound, meaning we will, meaning we need to alter our construction procedures in order to protect the ecology of the Puget Sound. There's also the possibility that we are next to apartment buildings, which means we will have to acquire noise ordinances from the city of Seattle in order to construct at certain times. And now I'm going to pass it over to Virginia with the sequencing. As for the construction sequencing, we'll be starting with the foundation, which is represented in red. Once the foundation is completed, we'll start with the markets framing, which is represented in the blue. The third step is the office framing along with the first level of stairs, which is represented in the green. The fourth step is the restaurant framing along with the second level of stairs, which is represented in the purple. The final step is the bridge and the third level of stairs, which is represented in the orange. And now on to the interior sequencing. Once the building is dried in and protected from the weather, the MEP can be installed. Since the larger equipment is installed first and we will be working top down, the HVAC can begin on the top floor. Once the HVAC is completed, it will be moved down and the plumbing scope equipment can be installed on the top floor. Once the plumbing scope equipment is completed on the top floor, then the HVAC and plumbing can move down another level, allowing the fire safety scope to begin on the top floor. Once the fire safety scope is completed, then the electrical scope can begin work on the top floor. The reasoning for working top down is to allow multiple scopes to work concurrently and decreases time on the schedule 
and prevents any invasion of space. Once the MEP is roughed in, then the finishes can begin from the top floor down, allowing to keep the building clean and preventing any damage. Next is Zach with safety concerns. Our main safety concerns are that we are in between two active roads as well as next to an active sidewalk. This will necessitate the erection of pedestrian protection as well as the hiring of people to either shut down the road or control traffic if that is necessary. We will also be building into a hill, which means we have to be careful to make sure that construction equipment does not fall either into the road or into our construction site. We will also be connecting to a parking garage, so we will have to shut down the area that we are connecting to in order to ensure proper safety. And now over to Virginia with COVID-19 specific concerns. As we perform construction during this pandemic, we'll be implementing the governor's orders to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. We will start the day by scanning for people's temperature before they enter the work site. We will be implementing a required use of PPE, so everyone is required to wear a face mask. We will be constantly disinfecting the commonly used surfaces, and employees will have start, staggered start times, which will result in different break times, preventing any large group gatherings. Everyone will remain at least six feet apart, and anyone who has traveled will be required to stay home for at least 14 days. Likewise, if anyone is sick, they are also required to stay home. We'll be innovative in tasks that require multiple people close together. We have attached the governor's guidelines towards keeping the environment, the safe environment. Thank you to, for listening to our construction presentation. Right. Thank you, Thursday. Um, I am going to let Sage and Sarah and Phil uh, ask a couple of questions. There's a few things in the Q&A. What do you think? I loved the architectural rendering myself. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. Absolutely. The, your renderings were beautiful in there. And, and, you know, I've got notes here saying that yeah, you guys did a great job pacing yourselves through the slides with a lot of content on the slides, but not overwhelming and, and being able to kind of talk at a great pace and explain what you were doing with images that were, you know, really great to look at. Um, and it, it never felt clouder, cluttered, it never felt rushed. Um, you guys did a, a really good job of kind of, with the preparation, it's clear in order to get through to a, to a great presentation. So I, I thought you guys did a great job again. Yeah. I, I second that, Sage. Um, I really enjoy the way that you guys approach the pedestrians first. Um, as somebody who doesn't own a car in Seattle, it's always nice to see new ways to venture through the town and also knowing how important that connection is across to Pike Place. I thought that was a really smart way to approach it. Um, and I also really thought you did a thoughtful job of actually creating an indoor and outdoor feel, even putting greenery around your columns to kind of blend building element versus natural element. Um, looks really fun to me. Um, one question I had for you uh, was around your flexible space and um, the different kinds of vendors and uses that you are going to have come in. And I wondered, um, because of the connection to Pike Place Market, if the team ever considered having that space up at the roof level, at the bridge level, back to Pike Place Market, and the restaurant down at the ground level heading out towards the water? Just a curious question. Yeah, so we kind of messed with um, each of our required areas at different heights and we ideally settled on the restaurant being at the tops just for the view um, and having that large walking path where a lot of people could sit and spend more time and um, be with the view and then as you continue um, down the steps to the marketplace kind of having the um, market by the water kind of vibe to kind of change it a little bit from Pike Place Market itself. I guess I would just start by saying too, 
really great presentation, lots of detail, but very well put together. You can follow it. Um, I could picture it, see it, understand it very well, especially the site map. I thought it was very, um, very well thought through and displayed. Um, and then the 3D modeling, you know, building your way up to Rhino, it looked great. Um, it really made me feel like I could be sitting at that bar with the side open and, uh, and enjoying the Puget Sound, so good job. Um, I guess one of my big questions for that site in that area, um, you guys did explore Pacific Place for the site tour, and then um, the team that got down to the site and explored that did the, um, the construction team that did the site challenges and the safety components. I'm wondering, I didn't see anywhere in here um, the construction of your bridge over the active railroad there and the railroad tunnel. Did you guys consider that or did you know it was there? We did consider the danger of building a road, I mean a bridge over a road. I was not aware that there was a railroad tunnel running under the bridge. Okay, yeah, it comes right out just to the north of that, but um, I guess part of your design was to connect to the garage, and so I guess structurally I was just thinking, did you guys do any research on the existing garage and loads, and would it be able to support that bridge? Hey, that's my question, Phil. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Adam, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, we didn't have specific information from that building. We attempted to find the information, but it just wasn't readily available. Um, also, didn't necessarily have time, but we made assumptions based off of the current structure in order to make sure that it was sound and that we could attach the bridge to it. Okay. Sage, you got another one? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that the uh, I, I to kind of echo Sarah's thoughts. You know, um, you know, one of my favorite things about Pike Place is wandering through it. And I think Isabella, I think you you said you know something about you know making the building something that you could meander through and really explore the building. And I think you guys kind of created that. Um, you know, I, the image from the top of the bridge looking out at uh, the Olympics really kind of made me want to go back um, and uh, have have a good time with you guys up there in the summer. Um, but uh, I think um, looking at um, kind of access, I, it looked like, um, I wasn't sure, I guess, how you get to, on that roof, that upper area, like that's all, kind of always one of the places that I want to explore. I think you mentioned that there was access to the roof gardens, but I, I don't I don't remember exactly. Could you kind of clarify kind of what was the intent was with those roof gardens and kind of how you would get there? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, so we wanted to implement the garden for like um, kind of like a rain roof um, to deal with some of the rain pour, um, and you can't really go into, there's an electrical box or like the main mechanical system up on the roof. Um, but if you go through the, uh, there's like a hallway next to our elevator that's part of our core that's continued on that level. And you can go straight through and there's just a strip of gardens that's um, just above the restaurant area. So you can just go sit there and it might have um, even vegetables or something for use in the kitchen. And then you can look out on the area, but it's kind of a smaller hidden gem so we don't want it to be a main focus point, but if you know it's there, um, there's like a hallway um, to get there, so. That's cool. Right. We do have one other uh, uh, structural question in here um, about the local soil conditions. And did you think about that or consider that as you were designing the foundations? Uh, yeah, Zach, you want to take that one? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, so for the soil, uh, so we talked, our the structural team, we talked about that for sure. Um, and uh, based off of our mentor's um, 
uh, feedback and their experience with soil, we decided uh, 3,000 PSF bearing pressure would be ideal for the calculations for the soil. Okay. I guess I have one other question. Um, just thinking about the office space and parking. Um, I know that you guys um, did a great job with the bike storage. I think everybody would appreciate that and the ride share drop off, which is a great idea. But I think there might be some requirements for some parking um, for the office space by the city. Is, is that something that was considered? Um, yeah. So Parking is one place that we kind of decided to sacrifice a little bit for the rideshare. Um, we looked at doing an underground parking lot, but ultimately having the entrance to the parking lot would take up too much of our site area to have enough usable space for our other elements. Um, and currently there is a parking space to the south side of our building, but that is where the music hall is going to be going. Um, so we couldn't really put parking there. So any, um, parking available for our building would be part of the garage that's across the street, street parking, or any new implemented parking by the waterfront as more buildings start to pop up. But right. we, we tried several things and ultimately it didn't work too well. Yeah, that's great though that you considered the other spaces around. Yeah, as long as it was a conscious decision. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then addressing, there's another question in the chat about building on a hill. Um, so we basically just intended to rebuild it to come in at a grade. Um, yeah, so the whole building would just be built into it or like at a slight grade. Awesome. Nice job, guys. Thank you. Um, OK. Wonderful. I want to um, just finish up and thank the three teams who were on the call, the presentations tonight. Congratulations on an awesome year. Um, these presentations were all really great, really inspiring. Um, the future of the building industry is in good hands. Um, and I just wanted to say one last thing. While there are many mentoring programs designed to give high school students exposure to architecture and engineering, ACE is unique. It exposes um, students to the breadth of the entire building industry while providing hands-on experience throughout a design project. Putting together this program takes a tremendous amount of time and energy and dedication. So we've compiled the numbers and we figured out that we run a $1 million program, but most of that money is um, from donated time from our volunteers, our mentors, donated venue space, meeting space. Um, so we don't have to cover a whole million dollars to put ACE on. Um, but there are some costs for insurance and uh, all sorts of background checks and things like that. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit. If you are ever inspired to donate, we will take, we can take those funds and put them into scholarships and um, some of our expenses that it does take to um, run the ACE program. There is a sheet in the program that I uh, emailed out earlier today that instructs you how to donate if you so feel inspired to do so. Um, but congratulations to all of the teams. I also want to give a great shout out to Mark um, Kinsman from Mortensen. He is our web host tonight. Ah, we could not do it without him. Uh, he <laughs> runs all of this and uh, <laughs> we've had practices and he fixes all the problems that we don't even know that we have. So I'm grateful for Mark. But that's it. Thank you. And we'll see you next year.